Living out on the Amazon, you're gonna need a rodent of unusual size. And that's why God gave us the Capybara. One quarter horsepower of grass-eating perfection, this ain't your daddy's guinea pig. Join us today as we ask the important questions. What is life as a Capybara like? Why are they so chill? Why won't the voices go away? Find out all this and more on this episode of Happy Barra. <coughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Happy Barra. I'm Dr. Happy and today we're talking about God's chosen rodent, the Capybara. Because if you're running an educational channel with a Capybara host, you gotta have an episode on Capybaras. I mean, if you don't, what are you even doing? There's a reason why everyone loves these things. They're so cute! I'm so cute! Okay, now that I've sold you on capybara supremacy, let's get started. The capybara roams the wetlands of South America and reigns as the king of rodents. And that's saying something considering how rodents are by far the most prolific group of mammals. What with some 40% of all mammals claiming to be a part of the holy rodent empire. But truly, the capybara stands above them all. Literally. Your childhood guinea pig may have died because he overfed it, but even that little fatty could have never held a candle to the absolute unit that is the capybara, which tips the scales at 66 kilograms or 146 pounds for people who are living in a country that won two world wars. This makes the capybara the largest rodent on Earth, with the largest capybara ever recorded being a female found in Brazil that weighed 201 pounds. While it's important to stress how big capybaras are, we don't hold the title for the largest rodent of all time. There's a handful of bigger guys like Josefo Artigasia that outgrew us by a pretty wide margin, but none of them lived past the Pleistocene. See, while capybaras were pulling up at the after party, they were pulling up at the afterlife. Cappy gang stay winning. Capybaras don't start life as the chunks that we all know them as. Unlike other rodents, capybaras give birth to what are called precocial young, which basically means that capybaras produce babies that are fully developed. Imagine going to the hospital because your pregnant wife started having contractions and driving home with a smaller version of yourself in the car. That's what life as a capybara dad is like. In fact, most rodents found in South America give birth to precocial young, which is another reason alongside Jetstream Sam that things from South America are big. These little bundles of joy are able to eat the same vegetation as the adults almost from birth, with the mother only allowing them to drink milk for about four months before cutting them off completely. This method of baby making allows Gabibara Young to survive if something were to happen to their mother, which is something that happens a lot as we'll discuss later when we talk about the Gabibara's predators. In order to offset the fact that Cappy babies can get murked by pretty much anything with a pulse, Capybara's gotta take some special care when it comes to making sure the next generation makes it to adulthood. As we have established, capybaras are rodents, and if there is one thing that rodents are good at doing, it's making more rodents. Capybaras are incredibly social animals, living in thriving herd communities led by one dominant male, who gets to breed with all the much larger females. That's right, if you play your cards right as a capybara, you get saddled with a harem of Amazon babes. And it's always time for Snoo Snoo. Being social creatures, capybaras are also known to engage in something called alloparenting. You ever heard of the phrase, it takes a village? Well, that's basically what alloparenting is. It's common to see cappy females taking turns watching the youngins, with some even nursing young that aren't even theirs. Must be nice. The closest thing my ex-wife ever came to practicing alloparenting was taking the dog in the divorce. Anyways, living in a big social group isn't just beneficial for raising young, but also beneficial for just staying alive. Because when you're the rainforest equivalent of a chicken nugget, you'd be smart to stick around with other chicken nuggets who could watch your back. Capybaras make great lookouts, with their eyes being oriented near the top and sides of their heads. They're able to see danger coming from almost any direction. And once they spot danger, capybaras are able to communicate using a variety of vocalizations, including whistles, barks, and squeals, as well as through scents secreted from their glands located on their faces and near their rear. 
Which means I can prove once and for all I'm not fat, it's just a glandular problem. Speaking of being fat, you'd imagine that as a rodent, capybaras live solely on a diet of drywall and cartoonishly large blocks of cheese. But you would be wrong and stupid. Capybaras are herbivores, which is a major factor in why humans have been allowed to live for so long. They prefer crap like reeds, grains, melons, and squashes, but their favorite food is every terminally online person's worst nightmare, grass. Seriously, we can't get enough of this stuff. In fact, the name capybara comes from the Tupi word capiguara, which roughly translates to master of grasses. On average, capybaras eat like six to eight pounds of grass like every frickin' day. And because of their incredibly fibrous and low nutrition diet, they will regurgitate their food to chew it again, as well as eat their own feces so they can give it another lap around the old intestine train. Son, you haven't vomited once this entire meal. Your mother slaved away in the kitchen all day just so you can eat that plate of grass. I know, Dad, I just, I don't think I like grass. Oh, Joshua! How dare you say something like that in front of your mother! Go to your room! Uh, okay, Dad. And in six to eight hours, I had better see you enjoying this meal again! In fact, a lot of the capybara's physiology comes from having to deal with their rough diet. Like all rodents, capybara's teeth never stop growing and need to be worn down by gnawing. This is because all rodents have something called open-rooted dentation. The incisors of all rodents are made up of a thin layer of hard enamel in the front and a thick layer of soft dentin in the back. This allows rodents to not only wear down their always growing teeth, but also makes them self-sharpening. This tooth shape allows rodents to be excellent at gnawing vertically. Unless you're a capybara and decide to go to the camel school of chewing your food, then go off, I guess. So we've established that capybaras are more into the gnawing grass instead of the gnawing flesh thing. In fact, it's often us who are the ones who are into getting their flesh gnawed on. Well, no, that's not right. I'm not into that at all, actually. Okay, so I'm gonna be real for a second here. As the world's largest rodent, I have all the defensive capabilities of a deflated football. So when your predators consist of things like ocelots, caimans, harpy eagles, anacondas, jaguars- OH MY GOD! I just watched someone die. D dude, you can't just show me a clip like that. I don't play freaking live leak footage when you're trying to do your job. Okay, placing that traumatic experience into a dark recess of my brain, capybaras are on the most wanted list of almost every predator in the entirety of South America. And that includes humans. Even the frickin' Pope decided that serving up cappy meat was a good idea. In the 16th century, Venezuelan clergymen wrote the Vatican, saying that they had found a quirky little animal with webbed feet that lived in water and kinda tasted like a fish if you licked it the right way. I think you see where this is going. Like the good Catholics that they were, they actually requested that the Vatican grant the capybara the status of fish so that they could eat it during Lent. And the papacy, having never done anything sketchy throughout its entire existence, granted the capybara the title of fish. Yeah, when I said that capybaras were God's chosen rodent, I wasn't kidding. As we spoke about earlier, the capybara's primary way of avoiding getting their booty chomped is sticking in a large social group, but they have one hidden talent that they can also utilize. Capybaras are excellent swimmers, which not only is valuable for escaping predators, but also for finding all the wetland plants that we love to eat. While capybaras might look kind of dumpy at first glance, all you gotta do is look a bit closer to discover that this Goliath Stuart Little has all the tools to make even swimmers like Michael Phelps look like they never even touched a pool before. Capybaras have a variety of amphibious adaptations to make them masters of the water, including things like webbed feet, ears and nostrils on the tops of their heads, and their weirdly insane lung capacity. When threatened, capybaras are able to dive into water and stay submerged for up to five minutes at a time. Which is a great talent for stealing change from the bottom of a wishing fountain, but to be perfectly honest, as a way to avoid predators, I think it's kind of flawed. I mean, yeah, if you were living in, like, Africa or something, it might work, but this is the Amazon. The capybara's predators consist of things like a literal sea serpent, the free trial version of an alligator, and the submarine of the cat world. But I'll be darned if we don't try our best. 
Which is actually a pretty good segue for the last thing I want to talk about. For an animal that's got to go to sleep every night knowing that we might wake up inside the belly of the world's largest snake, capybaras are surprisingly chill about it. If you've been on the internet for longer than five minutes, I'm sure you've been waiting for me to cover what might be the defining feature of the capybara. Yes, dear students, capybaras are what science refers to as a vibe. But why is that? Well, there used to be a widely supported hypothesis that it might have been because capybaras evolved in an environment where they had no real predators. And now they don't know how to act when the whole rainforest is trying to kill them, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna have to politely disagree. True capybaras show up in South America around 9 million years ago during the Miocene, before they and their relatives started spreading northward until they hit the southern part of what is now North America around 3.5 million years ago. How about I introduce you to a short list of animals that capybaras had to share a zip code with during that stretch of time. We got the best character from Ice Age, man's best friend in the capybara's worst nightmare, Winnie the Pooh if he dropped the honey and started shooting up anabolic steroids, Big Bird and Hannibal Lecter's unholy offspring, and of course, a came in the length of a bus with a bite force twice that of Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah, no frickin' thank you. If my underwater condo was parked right next to the closest that nature ever came to creating frickin' Godzilla, the number of after parties I would be attending would be severely limited. A lack of predators, this is not. So if it's not a lack of predators, what gave the capybara their notoriously chill nature? Well, it all comes back to the fact that they're social creatures and are a big fan of that allo parenting thing. In fact, there have been more than just a handful of accounts of capybaras raising young that aren't even a part of their own species. The most famous instance of this is a capybara named Cheesecake, which is already adorable. Cheesecake was an orphaned capybara who currently lives at the Rocky Ridge Refuge Animal Sanctuary in Arkansas. And let me tell you, when I say she's the mom of the century, I mean it. Cheesecake has raised puppies, ducklings, deer, tortoises, emus, horses, chickens, and finally, in 2014, she was able to become best buddies with another capybara. What a woman. So yeah, if Cheesecake is anything to go off of, capybaras really live up to the meme. Their chill nature has caused them to go somewhat viral over the past few years. In fact, hashtag capybara on TikTok has more than 7 billion views. Capybaras are so dope that more people have viewed capybara videos than there are years that the entire Earth has existed. Our meteoric rise in popularity isn't much of a mystery. As dumb and mushy as it sounds, the common theme in everything that the capybara does is a certain kindness that I can't really put my finger on. I wouldn't call it love, because anthropomorphizing an animal isn't really scientific, and everyone knows that scientists are loveless creatures. But in a world where most discourse is done through internet slap fights hosted on cesspits like Twitter, it's no surprise that the internet would begin to gravitate towards an animal that is the embodiment of both love and acceptance of others. So. Yeah, of all the animals on Earth, it is the capybara that earns the title of world's chillest fluffball. Not me, though. I'll put you in the ground. Speaking of ending things, I think that's a good place to conclude today's lecture. If you enjoyed your time in my class, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. This has been Happy Bara, and until next time, take a page from the capybara's book and go cuddle a stranger. Class dismissed. Ah!